New surface options in action include the new perspective option. So if we look at bilinear first and see what that does, if we set up a bilinear, so if you're doing some corner pinning or something like that, or screen placement, you can see that what happens with bilinear is that you get quite a distortion. Um, we can toggle that live to perspective, and you can see in perspective mode it's actually starting to obey proper perspective based on the corner points rather than a distortion that you would normally get with bilinear. Other useful attributes of the perspective surface is that if we line something up uh, roughly in perspective on here, we want to start kind of doing some tracking. So normally with a bilinear, you're going to get four corner points uh, that if you move, you're going to adjust the shape of this. Uh, when we go into the vertices on here, in the perspective, you get still get four corners and position, rotation, and scan, etc. But you also get a default perspective tracking. This changes the dynamics slightly on the actual points here. If we just quickly gang all these together, and kind of make them a little bit small. Uh, we don't really have to worry about where these points are at all. We can just sort of pick them up, move them around, because actually all we're really doing is tracking the perspective, not actually the four corners. Uh, we can also go in and add uh, kind of like additional points as well, if we feel that we need some more tracking points to make to sort of work out that perspective surface. Uh, the rule is that we have, it, have to have at least four at any given time, but we can kind of turn these on and off. So once you've got something like that going, do like a little bit of tracking. It's going to kind of stop that return back here. And you can see that even though we move those four corner points around, uh, we're actually just tracking the perspective, which then gets applied to the surface. So perspective surface is a good option if you want to use it for doing things like corner pinning as a replacement to bilinear. New options when working with extended by cubics now allow us to go through and subdivide the mesh as we always could but also merge the mesh back into something simpler. Uh, we can also preserve things like animation while we do this. So if we just subdivide this a couple of times to start off with, I'm uh, just gonna go into our magnet tool, and uh, we're gonna grab a load of points and move them here, grab a load of points and move them over there, and then kind of do the reverse on this one a little bit further out, we'll do this, something like this. You can see now that we obviously have like an animation going on. Um, if you needed some more resolution for this mesh, you want to do some more final work, we can come through and we can subdivide that several times. And the animation that's already there will be interpolated to the denser mesh. And once again, we can go through and we can make some kind of refinements to what we're working with. We want to make some uh, sort of lo localized adjustments on this as well. We can also go that process backwards, but also be careful when merging back a denser mesh with animation to something simpler. If you go back too far, you will start to destroy the animation. But we do have the uh, opportunity now to merge and subdivide extended by cubic meshes. Replicate is an interesting creative graphics tool uh, that allows you to produce duplicates of pretty much any object inside of Action. Uh, to use Replicate, simply attach it to the object you want to duplicate or replicate, type in the amount of copies that you'd like, and then start playing with some of the offsets in position and rotation. Uh, once you create your offsets, you can go back to the original parent axis of an object, you can move that around and then start manipulating either the rotation and scaling and other parameters inside the replicate node, or in fact inside of your master uh, object axis like here. So you can see it's really easy once you start making the adjustments and start animating, you can create some really cool motion graphics kind of effects. And you can use replicate on pretty much any object as we said. So here we're doing it on things like surfaces, you could also do it on 3D models. What's also nice for using textures if we use it on some of the lens flare presets. So here we have one of the lens flare presets. So we're just going to attach our replicate to this. Once again, type in uh, X amount of copies. And then you can see as we start to manipulate these offsets and axes, we can create some interesting textures, uh, things that look like stage lighting, uh, just animating textures for motion graphics purposes and things like that. So really creative tool, uh, replicate. The introduction of 3D Shape gave the artist the ability to create custom geometry within the action scene using G masks and multiple G masks attached to a 3D Shape object. The 3D Shape object allows us to do several things. It allows us to give physical volume or depth to the object, as well as adjust the edge profile in a variety of ways. We've added things like parametric bevel to easily shape and position the beveling of the edges as well as bevel, rotation and scaling, all of which are profile driven and allow us to add custom points to further sculpt the geometry. Using multiple shapes and G masks 
attached to a 3D shape allows us to create quick and easy Boolean operations to start to construct more complex geometries for our scenes. 3D Shape and GMask also allows us to import and pass SVG or scalable vector graphics into the action scene. This allows us to have continuously vectorized high quality graphics inside of our action scene for our motion graphics and other uses. It's also a great way of bringing in logos and graphics that have been made in other products that deal with SVG, such as Adobe Illustrator. So over the releases, lots of changes have happened to the lighting and rendering model inside of Action. We're just going to be quickly looking at IBL, image-based lighting. So image-based lighting we introduced uh, quite some time ago. Uh, we can attach IBLs to either the camera or to any objects within the scene, just to make it a little bit more obvious what's going on here. We're just going to use that as back. So image-based lighting is in fact using, as the name suggests, uh, another image, in this particular case a cityscape, to in fact light objects within the scene in a natural way. When we originally brought this out, we just had support for reflection. Uh, we now have support for ambient lighting as well, which is obviously a lot more softer. We're kind of casting tones and colors over the objects instead of using them as a reflection map. Uh, we've also done some things with uh, texture read files. Uh, so we're going to see read files a little bit more when we start looking at 3D objects coming in. Uh, but we also now give you four example IBLs to load into your scene and to play around with. And of course, you can either create your own or import more as you need. But IBL is a great way of naturally lighting your scene, particularly good if you're working with CGI elements or 3D models. It also ties in really nicely to the advancements and changes to the shader model and rendering engine of action over the releases. So this is an incredibly useful feature addition, and it's to do with when we're working with extended by cubics. So if we just go and subdivide our plane a little bit, um, obviously when you're working with extended by cubics, we're kind of warping the image by moving, animating, um, or tracking these points. Now sometimes you don't actually want to distort the geometry. It would be quite nice if we could actually move the texture inside of that geometry. So if we just reset that back for a second, and in this view, we're going to go to what we call our F8 view. So on the left-hand side, we've got the view of the surface. And the right-hand view in pink, we've got the view of the texture. So once again, um, using our Select tool, if we pick a point as we just did on the actual surface, you see that we're actually distorting that. Now inside the menu you've got two new options, there's a vertices and a UV points because we can animate and track these independently as well as copy the animation to and from the respective controls. But also in the tool selection we have a couple of extra tools that we can use. Slide texture, if we use it in the UV viewport, if we grab this you can see there I'm not actually distorting the surface but I'm actually moving the UV texture within that surface which is really useful. There's one final feature here which is called Move UV Vertex and this is particularly useful if you want to create things like explicit crops or patches on an image. What it does, it moves both the geometry and the UV points simultaneously. So let's have a look how that works. So I've reset my extended by cubics back to the default, just the four corner points and I'm using my Move UV Vertex tool. So in either viewport what's going to happen is I start to grab this, you can see because I'm moving not only the surface controls but also the texture controls, I'm in fact creating a custom explicit crop on the image. This is my result view, this is my view of the actual surface inside the action and over here on the right hand side you can see the corresponding UV texture points are also being moved. At this point I can actually go through and then do things like create a more denser mesh and track objects inside of here to either stabilize textures or do more advanced texture mapping with animation onto the surfaces. So by splitting down the control points of the surface and the UVs, making extended by qubits much more flexible for use in compositing inside of Action for a variety of tasks. There's been some changes to the way that we process objects in the media list. So there's been some optimization on the rendering and the processing speed. Everything is now brought up to the same level as batch inside of Action, which is a good thing. Um, there's been some certain reinterfacing here as well, so things like lock, 
uh, which are generally, uh, we just had sort of like a lock was on or off, but you never really knew what frame you were locking. And if you kind of scrub through here, now you can see what actual frame you're locked on, which is kind of quite nice. Things obviously like slipper as before. You're also gonna notice that color correct and color warper are tools that we can have on simultaneously. So here, if we do some work in the color warper, something like this, make it nice and magenta color. Uh, we can actually have the color correct at the same time and then we can go through and we can add some uh, tools that are not present in the color warp inside of here, so sort of like gamma tools, something like that, which is quite good. Things like blur as they were before, so we can blur an X and Y for the front and matte, which is good. Uh, but if you treble click on the little tick box under the blur, we get access to the full blown blur tool from Batch, which is quite nice, uh, with all the various modes inside of there. So if we do something like radial, and we do something like this, we can get access to all of these tools that were part of the batch blur tool, but we get those directly inside of action, which is good. Changes to animation, which is uh, a welcome thing. So uh, once before, animation of the media layers was only sort of visible um, internally while you're in those modules. Uh, but now, because of the change in the media list and the processing pipeline, if we do something really nice and obvious, some animation over time, oh, this is gonna look gorgeous something like that so now we have an animating color correct over time if we look into our animation editor now um, anything that's animating in these media lists these media slots inside of action is available at the global animation editor for inside batch so here we can see our other objects inside of batch here's our action and here's the animation that we've just put onto the color corrector inside of that action so lots of good changes to the media list, optimization in pipeline and rendering, as well as also some enhanced functionality when it comes to animation and the way that we work with those tools. More improvements in action now, and this is to do with Matchbox. Matchbox shaders we originally introduced inside of Batch as a tool that you could put inside of the flow graph. Uh, but we introduce those into action as a way of enhancing and being able to apply effects to media layers in the action environment and it's very useful. You're going to see that there's a matchbox tab in our tool bin for action down here and it's really as simple as doing uh, just selecting the layer that we want to apply the effect to and dragging out a matchbox shader. Also in the all nodes bin if we look for a matchbox shader that will take you to the browser where you can load up external GLSL shaders from various sources. We're going to be using the matchbox that are directly inside of here. Now you can see I've done a particularly bad key. We're going to be using this uh, for another video in a minute. Uh, but there's some nice tools inside of here that you wouldn't expect. Uh, something like parallax spread. So parallax spread is a tool that we have outside in batch. Uh, it takes a form of pixel spread. But here we've got a similar tool that we can actually start doing that same sort of process live inside of action, which is really nice. Now what's good is that we can stack up multiple effects on the layer. So if I wanted to do some color correct, to then sort of blend her a little bit more into the back plate. It's simply bringing out another tool, making sure that it's parented up, and then we can start to use some things like uh, contrast just to make that look just a little bit sort of better. Very nice. Now, of course, we can apply multiple effects to multiple layers. So on my background, we're gonna put my old favorite, a little bit of uh, chromatic aberration onto this one, just to make it look really sort of chromatically aberrated, I guess is the word but then maybe we want to share an effect between these two layers. So maybe we've got things balanced out, but we want to do a, a global color correct onto both. So we're going to attach it to this particular layer, but if we actually parent up to multiple layers, then this effect is going to be modifying both those media layers. So once again, if we came in here and we just made you know, the saturation really sort of saturated, and then maybe just sort of gave it an overall cast like this, you can see that on top of all the effects, we've now got one effect that is affecting multiple layers. Also worth noting that in the media layer uh, for things now, especially when you're working with matchboxes and G masks and lights, etc., if we swipe down, we have multiple priority editors. So we have one for all objects in action, we have for matchbox only, lights and G masks. And what this means is that for any given layer, we can affect the actual processing order of how these effects are applied to the layer. So the top is our result, this is process next, this is process first. So by moving these around, we in some cases can change the overall effect that those shaders have on the image. So Matchbox in action. So Matchbox in action was such a great idea, we thought we'd extend the same thing to lights and surprisingly enough, do a thing called Lightbox. 
Uh, once again, Lightbox has its own node bin down here, but if we do all nodes and look for Lightbox, we can drag this out and it will take you to the Lightbox browser. Now, by and large, most of these are color correction or look development tools, uh, but the whole point is, is that we can now project and limit these through the cone of a light and also attach some G-Master lights as well to further limit them. Um, there's some really useful ones and there's also some uh, volumetric effects as well, but we're gonna look at some stuff that's not typically a color corrector, but like a color suppress. So with Lightbox on a light, the default functionality of the light to light things is kind of disabled when you put a light box on. Nothing's really going to happen in the scene. Um, we still have the light. We could actually still make the light light things by turning it on and actively rendering it. But by default, when you drag it out of the light box, it knows that you're actually going to be projecting effect down. Uh, once again, you can use these as directional tools. You can change the, the type of uh, light that we have. So we're going to change ours to a spot for a second. And What's kind of nice about this, we kind of zoom in a little bit, is that in this particular case, uh, we can do things like localized color suppressing. So this is the reason why I did this really horrendous key. Uh, normally you would do a color suppress outside, part of the keying process, but sometimes maybe if you've got like a badly lit um, or uneven chroma key background, uh, one color suppress value is not gonna satisfy all the different elements. And this way is a quite nice way of localizing that in different ways. Uh, the tool works exactly the same way as it does outside in batch. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of uh, pick our color suppress color, which is going to be our green. Uh, in our color suppress tools down here, we're also going to pick uh, the same color green there as well. Uh, that's going to give me a plot down here. If we look back at our result view for a second, and we just add a point around about there and start to drag that down, what you're going to see is that I'm actually suppressing through the cone of a light the green in that particular area. So you can see that the area where this is pointing to, no more green. The area where it's not pointing to, still green. So using tools like this in conjunction with things like parallax spread inside of action, you can actually achieve a lot of the results that you would have normally done inside a batch. It's really useful. Uh, the other thing that you can do with this as well is you can attach G masks. So, you know, we're limiting the effect of this light box via the cone of a light. Uh, but if you so wish, you could come in uh, we could sort of add a just a bog standard uh, G mask inside of here and we could just draw an area that we wanted to limit and just like everything else what we would then do is we would use our uh, G mask link tool and we can say that this is only going to affect this light and then what will happen now is that a combination of the G mask and the cone of the light will limit the light box effect. So just before we leave Lightbox, some other things that we're just going to quickly look at to do with Lightbox. In the Lightbox browser, as you can see, there's loads of color correct and look treatments, um, but there's also some stuff that deals with casting 3D volumes in space. We'll talk about a, bit, a little bit more when we look at camera effects. So some selected 3Ds, there's various ways that we can select in volumes, but there's some uh, shaders in here that will actually cast a 3D volume in space. And um, we're going to look at quickly at this fog one. So here's a little 3D scene set up in space. I've got uh, some 3D text that says near, middle, and you can't read that one, and some 3D geometry along the side as well. Uh, this particular light box shader is a fog caster, so it's actually casting a 3D volume in space. If we change the color of that for a second, it's now casting a yellow uh, throughout, so we're gonna change it back to uh, black for a second. But the whole point is, is that through a light box shader, we can actually cast volume. So this is not really lighting these objects because it would it just light everything kind of evenly. We're actually generating like a 3D volume that's a particular color or a fog in 3D space. So these light box shaders actually do work in a 3D environment. And that theme continues when we start looking at camera effects as well. So let's talk about lights. Lots of lighting changes uh, in respect of supporting the new rendering and functionality inside of action but we're going to have a quick whistle stop tour through what's new in lights so starting with the light themselves and we've still got all the light types that we had before um, down here we've got free and target lights now so target lights we have a, another axis that we can obviously parent to or animate or track to which is kind of quite nice now we still have things like spread and etc and decays uh, but if we go down to the profile, we've added a parametric fall off. It's still the old curve custom one, but the parametric one is kind of just like a little bit more easy to operate and gives you a nice soft kind of fall off. So parametric curve fall off, a little bit like the bevel adjustments that we had in 3D shape, etc. There's also two additional tabs if you're using a light box shader on a light and also if we're looking at G masks. 
So G masks allow us to limit the output of a light through a G mask as well. If we just have a quick look at this, I've got a G mask floating around in space and you can see the default behavior is that it's cutting a big hole through everything inside the scene. However, if I go through and I link uh, that G mask to a particular light, what it's doing now is it's working in combination with the cone to further restrict the output of the light. And you can see you can kind of use these as like a gobo. When they're attached to a light, they cease to be a mask that cuts through the scene and they're literally just limiting the effect of the light output. So that's a really useful little feature. Sometimes if you're working with multiple lights, it's a bit hard to arrange them in the scene. So if we have a light selected and we hit F8, uh, what we actually can do now is look through a light as if it was a camera and that kind of helps us to then line up where the, the light should actually be projecting through. So at the moment I'm tilting it down like this. If I look at, back at my camera result viewer for a second, you can see that I was looking through the camera, I was pointing it down, and this is the result of that in the scene. So F8 allows us to look through the light as an object, which is really good. Some new things you're going to notice in the rendering, obviously the light can be active or not active. Um, additive lights we'll look at in a moment. Uh, but we've got this button down here called Scene Ambient and also shading. So shading, once again, turns off on and off shading as it says, but scene ambient is a, a general global illumination light. So this is kind of the default light, um, lighting model if you haven't got any lights in the scene, that it's invisible ambient lights are always there. That can also be accessed down in the rendering preferences. Um, you can control the intensity of this as well, as well as also the default shading. And once again, you can mix and match this, you know, we can actually have a light active in combination with the scene ambient at the same time. So some nice options down here, just to be aware of um, if you're looking for where shading is and wonder what the scene ambient does, it's a global illumination light. So back with working with our lights now, um, what we're going to do is we're going to turn on an additional two lights and our original light we've been looking at, I'm just going to change into green. So in the default method um, of working with lights, they are always in what we call additive mode. Um, under the blue drop down, uh, we can actually turn these into what we call solo lights and solo light and solo lights purely allow us to project the color of the light without it blending in with other lights that are in the scene. Once again, you can do this on a light by light basis, but it's this kind of quite a nice option creatively uh, depending on what kind of effect you want your lighting to have. Finally, when you're working with multiple lights, which once again, these could also have light box effects on them. Um, if we go and swipe down in the media list, you can see that whenever we select a light, we automatically go into the, the lights priority editor. And once again here, you can arrange the lights in the order which they draw and also any light box effects which are attached to those lights as well. So here's a nice little enhancement with a feature called look at link. So what we've got here in our little scene is uh, an arrow and I've pre-animated three characters, one, two, three, and they all do kind of different things moving around in space. Now, if we want this arrow to follow a particular object, uh, we used to be able to do this uh, through expressions, but expressions could get a little bit complicated and sometimes it's nice to have a graphical way of doing it. So this is our arrow and these are our three objects, one, two, and three which have the animation on. We go down to our tool chest and we go to our look at link. This enables us to connect an axis to look at another object. So if I connect my arrow to number one and I scrub through, you can see now what's happening is that my arrow will follow object number one. And if I sever that and connect it number two, it will now follow number two and so on and so forth. Now, Sometimes you like actually to get that to animate over time. So with this graphical way of getting objects to look at other objects, we can actually animate that over time as well. So if we turn on our animation button and say, well, to start off with, I want my arrow to look at object number one until maybe the animation starts to move on number two. And I can say, well, round about that frame, I would like it to then start to look at object number two. And you can see what it's done now is it's starting to look at ob object number two at that point. And then we're going to go a little bit further down through this and wait till object number three starts to animate somewhere around about there. And I draw another link saying at this point I would like it to start following number three. And if we go back to the head of the timeline, 
the arrow following the objects and at those keyframes will transition over to the other object. So it's following number one until it's number two, and it follows number two until I ask it to look at number three, and then it's going to follow number three all the way through to the end. This is expressed in the animation editor as a look at link. So if we look at this, uh, we've got our look at curve here, and we can go through and we can modify the points at which that transition happens. So animating look at links is a really nice way of getting objects to follow other objects with all that, without all that complicated expression stuff. It's worth looking at. We're going to be looking at some changes to the no preferences inside of Action. Over the course of releases, there's been updates and changes to rendering preferences and adaptive degradation menus. But in the rendering, uh, we've got some uh, options down here when it comes to working with scene linear material. So Action is fully scene linear compliant for compositing, uh, but you've got some options down here where you can override that behavior uh, as much as clamp color output. So if you don't want values to go below zero above one, you can physically clamp colors coming out of Action. Uh, and also sometimes when you're working with values that are below zero and above one, and you're doing compositing with mats and modification, sometimes uh, that can give you unpredictable results and it, you can also clamp the divide at that point as well so things behave a little bit more predictably. Down here we've got an overscan option. So overscan uh, renders out more pixels either for physical output or for internal use when you're calculating things like glows or blurs. It sort of supersedes the idea of changing the resolution of your action and then applying and scaling, which in some circumstances, especially if you're doing tracking and masking, give you slightly unpredictable results. This physically increases the output size of the action. So here I've got my lens flare, and the real world, obviously, you'd have, uh, it wouldn't be cut off at the edge, you'd have a bit more going out this way, and we have a bit more of a lens flare coming down here. And you may want to have a bit more canvas room to work with downstream in batch. So, and the render out, if we change this to 150%, uh, the actual resolution of the action still is at 1920 1080, but we're rendering out 50% more pixels all around. You can see that we've got a bit more canvas. When we go downstream into another action, which is 1920 1080 still, um, and we pick this up, you can see that we've actually now got 50% more pixels. If we actually slip the, slip the layer, you can see that I've actually got this amount of room to play around with. It's a bit more elbow room, and it's a, quite a good way of working. Sometimes it's quite advantageous. Another time where it's good to have extra pixels is when you're doing the old trick of stabilizing something, correcting, and then inverting the stabilizer to recreate the plate. So here what I've got is uh, this pan around of a building. Um, in my first action here, I've done a perspective grid track on this. And there is a bit of a trick with this where we can stabilize and correct the perspective in one go. So if we hook this up to our original layer that we were tracking, uh, we change this to a 2D transform and invert stabilization uh, you can see now that what we get here is actually the perspective corrected and the track stabilized the movement but if we zoom out we can see that the actual layer now is much bigger than our 1920 1080 so when we were to go through the process of doing our corrective work on this and inverting stabilization we wouldn't actually be able to make up the plate because we don't have all the information this is a good opportunity to use this overscan. So if we increase this to around about 300% extra, and we kind of zoom back now, you can see that what we've got is the entire contents of that track are now contained within the canvas size, which is what we want. So if we came out of this action and we went down and did our corrective work, in this particular case, I've drawn something in that says my flat because it's obviously all stabilized up and nothing is kind of moving. We're just working at this point on a static plate as far as movement. And then in an action downstream from here, which was duplicated, we now want to invert that stabilization and perspective correction. So we go into the perspective tool, uh, we turn off invert, we take it back to a 2D, 3D transform, and we go back to the beginning on this, and you can see that everything gets recorrected back out. Now, because we duplicate the action, uh, the rendering is still set for 300%, so if we go and change that back to 100, then you can see here that what we're back to is where we started, but with our corrective work or my sort of cheesy little handwritten sign on top. So render out is a really good option for when you're doing things like stabilization or just need an extra bit of canvas. Remember it's in the no preferences. So after matchbox and lightbox effect, it made sense that we could apply effects directly to the camera. We call these camera effects. 
Then you actually know bin under the matchbox. We can pretty much apply any of the matchbox effects to the camera. Uh, if you look for things that begin with S, you can see a whole bunch of Stingray shaders. So these are shaders that we've used some of the code from the Stingray engine and we've utilized that inside of action to accelerate things that are normally processor heavy. So our little 3D scene's got some animation. We've got some cogs moving around, animating. If I zoom in a little bit on our scene. Uh, we've got a Stingray motion blur effect. So if we hook the camera up to that, you can see what we're going to get is realistic real-time motion blur based on the speed of the objects that are moving. Once again, all these shader effects go directly through the GPU to accelerate performance. Ambient occlusion or contact shadows is really nice as well. If we grab uh, all these groups and move them closer or away from another surface, you can see that we get realistic dirt shadows or ambient occlusion as well as internal to the geometry. Blooming is provided. We can bloom uh, based on the intensity and also set thresholds for different properties as well. And most of these uh, shader effects, you're going to see different ways of selecting the range or what area you want to work on. So depth, distance, uh, physical volumes relative to the object of the world or the camera, normals and color selectives. Depth of field, again, is a processor heavy effect. Um, so inside of here, we can have a viewing range based on depth of field or where actually we want our sharpness to be plus the range either side of that. And you can see now that based on this, we can do real time camera depth of field based on that through that shader. Other effects that you didn't have previously access to are things like reflections. So through the reflections Stingray shader, we can do camera based scene reflections, not only on the surfaces, but also internal to objects as well. And once again, reflections have extra properties on where they cast and how they receive based on these different parameters that we looked at earlier. General matchbox effects can also be applied to the camera. So here we've got a small selection. Things like blur, we're actually blurring 3D geometry in 3D space, still maintaining the ability to go around and orbit those objects and look at them. Dots, once again, is a pixelation effect that we're applying, but again, this is being applied in a 3D space as we orbit and dolly the camera around the scene. Distortion effects can also be added through the camera. And this is going to affect everything in the scene. However, what we've got up here is a G mask. And by default, the G mask is cutting a hole through everything in the scene. However, if we hook the G mask up to the actual camera and then tell the specific effect to use a G mask input, we can then manipulate the G mask around and we can get that distortion effect to happen only in certain places. Once again, this is happening in a 3D space. So as we orbit our camera around and manipulate our G mask, we are actually only distorting or warping the areas that are cutting through that G mask. So that's a brief tour around camera effects, but I hope you can see that this is a real big improvement on the way that we can work and be creative inside the action environment. What you also may have noticed is that we're also previewing these effects live. And this is down to the change in the viewport rendering that we've now got. Flame and action now default to this live preview mode down here. If we toggle that off back to the legacy 3D mode, we're not going to see any of those post-processing effects that are done by the camera. However, in the 3D mode, we do have access to see objects outside the canvas as we did previously. But working in the default preview mode will crop the output of the viewport to the boundaries of the action resolution. Shadow casting has also had a big improvement in quality and performance. If we turn on our shadow cast node down here, we can see that a couple of things have changed in the parameters. Uh, shadows are now calculated at 32 bits. Uh, the legacy value of 16 bits is still available, but in this mode, you're probably going to see some artifacts. So 32 bit is now the default. You're also going to see an increase in the size of the shadow maps by default from 2, 4, and 8K where available, depending on your graphics card configuration and the system that you're using. All in all, these improvements. Uh, now make shadows of a, a much higher quality, more responsive, and when you're using things like linear decay or one of the K modes, uh, a lot more photorealistic within the action scene. A little thing now, but the addition of being able to create and save your own lens flare presets. So if we just go into the uh, presets for lens flares, uh, I'm just going to look at all the subdirectories here for a second. Uh, we're just going to load one of these up. I'm going to make some modifications of it to make it uh, unique. So I particularly like green lens flares, they're really nice. And what we're going to do is we're going to double up on some of these. So we're just going to duplicate that out, hook that back in. And then we're just going to sort of adjust some of the positions of some of these streaks. 
and rotation of some of those elements as well. So now I've got something that's a bit more custom for what I actually need to work with. Looks really nice. And I want to save that configuration. Down the lens flare, I can now load and save. So if I save this, it's going to take me to a preset, going to take me to a preset directory. I'm going to call this Stewie Green. Save that up. Now what I can do is using the load button, I can I can go and browse all my lens flares. I can pick one, I can load that back up into the action scene exactly as I left it. So lens flare presets, the ability to create and save and load your own presets. Create camera is a new feature inside of action. It allows us to create a new camera from the working camera view inside the action scene. So here's my little 3D scene. I've got my jet fighter doing a fly past on a sky. Uh, now sometimes when you're working in the working or perspective view camera, uh, you may stumble upon a, a better view or something you like to use as a cutaway. So here I am in my perspective or working camera view and uh, as I navigate around the scene and sort of do some dollies in, I actually may get something that looks a little bit more dramatic, sort of something like a three quarter underside or something like this. That looks pretty good, that would be maybe nice as an alternative camera view or an output or even a cutaway. From that view, if I do spacebar C, in my action schematic you can see I've now created a new camera. And I can carry on and do this as many times as I want. Maybe it'd be nice to have like a reverse view looking towards uh, the other horizon, something like this. As the jet goes through, that will be also quite nice as a colorway. And once again, if I do spacebar C, I can then create another new camera. Going back to my default camera, you can see that I've still got all my original settings there. But in the camera list now, I can toggle through to see the alternative angles that I generated through the working camera view. From here, I can either output these as separate render passes, or I can actually animate through the cameras as part of the render process from action. That's create camera from working view. So we're going to look at all the changes in navigation, widgets and manipulation, and there's quite a lot going on. So without further ado, let's crack on with this. Um, so navigation in general and widgets and manipulation have changed significantly um, inside of action, not only in the schematic, but also in the viewport. Pretty much brings it into alignment with the way that you manipulate and navigate uh, viewports inside of Maya. So if we kind of look in our schematic uh, for starters, um, we've got a couple of objects here. You can see we've got some fighter jets, all very exciting. Uh, we can now uh, multi-select, shift select and move multiple objects around. You're gonna see that this is exactly the same as we do inside of batch now as opposed to still doing an alt shift down, we can actually select multiple objects and we can kind of move those around uh, independently. So that's good stuff. Um, we've also got some navigation for the actual uh, framing and selection of it. So you know, say you're working on like a big schematic and things get a bit lost. If we do spacebar A over that viewport, it will frame everything. And if we have a selected object, if we do spacebar F, it will frame and center that object. So spacebar A and spacebar F allows you to quickly navigate around your schematic. This is also the same in the viewport. So we're gonna look at the manipulators in a second, uh, but spacebar A and spacebar F perform similar functions. So here at the moment, we're looking at my result view. Um, if I go spacebar A, what will happen is it will frame all the objects in the viewport through the working camera. So this is a little bit different how we used to go into the working camera before. If you remember, we went spacebar F4. We're going to do spacebar A. will take us into our working camera view. Now, if you make a selection of a particular object inside of there and do spacebar F, it will now, like in the schematic view, it will now center and frame that selected object. Now, not only that, but it also sets the uh, point of rotation for the working camera around that object. So once again, it makes it a lot easier to manipulate and start looking and uh, moving around inside your viewport for the working camera. So while we've got some stuff selected, let's talk about other navigation modes inside of not only the working camera, but also for the result camera as well. So I'm using a Wacom pen and tablet. You can use a mouse as well, but the hotkeys on the Wacom is that if I want to orbit around anything, if I hold down the Alt key, on the keyboard and then just drag around my pen, I can orbit. If I do Control and Alt, that allows me to dolly in and out. And if I do Alt and Shift, that allows me to pan around the views. And if we go back to our result view for a second, those same hotkeys, so same navigation allows me to directly manipulate and interact with the current camera. So dollying, orbiting, and panning around to frame my views. So just a lot easier than 
the method that we used to have in some of the previous releases. So we've just hidden a few of those jets for a second because we're going to look at manipulating um, actual objects. So one of the changes is that um, just to select an object now we can just tap anywhere in it and that just takes us into a selection mode. Uh, we, there's no danger of, of me kind of accidentally moving it on that first tap uh, but then it does activate uh, a boundary box and we can also change that as well. So the default now is this bounding box but we can go wireframe and uh, bounding, bounding box but it also activates the um, the widget for the axis or the manipulator. So let's just zoom in a little bit on this for a second. So you can see here uh, we've got uh, an axis that looks very much like or a manipulator that looks very much like uh, you'd expect to find inside a Maya. Um, now selecting the middle of this puts this into free movement, but obviously then selecting any of the arrows will constrain the movement to that particular direction. Now you're also going to see. Uh, that we've also got some patches, some color patches in here as well. And what these do is allow you to move the object excluding that particular axis. So like the red one will, will allow us to move it in uh, Y and Z and it excludes X. This will exclude Y, this will exclude Z. So you're kind of moving it in just in two planes. The other thing that we've got is a, a quick hotkey way of, of going through or cycling through the different manipulation modes. So at the moment I'm in uh, move or translate mode and that's assigned to the T hotkey. If I go to R, that takes me into the rotate tool. You can see here I can you know, limit the uh, rotation axis by grabbing onto one of these. And once again, if you grab into the middle of there, you've got free rotation. And E takes me into scaling. And once again, if I go to the middle of the scaling manipulator, I do it proportionally. If I do it on any particular axis, I'm doing it unproportionately. Uh, and, and in the scaling, you've also got the way to scale excluding one of the other planes as we did have in the manipulator mode. So it's E for scale, R for rotate, T for translate. We also now have different axis orientation modes. So if I come back out to my working camera view for a moment, so this is my working camera view. At the moment, I'm in uh, what we call object orientation, which means that my axes are kind of aligned with the orientation of my object, as you can see here. We've got a couple of other modes as well. If we go to world mode, then regardless of the rotation of the object, you can see here that my, my object is actually rotated away from the camera. Um, it, the axes are always going to point in a consistent direction, a world direction. And sometimes it's just easier to manipulate objects um, having everything pointing in the same direction if you've got multiple things. We've got one more here called the camera. And the camera orientation will only ever present you with two visible axis movements. So if I'm looking sort of roughly side on to my jet here, and you can see I can move it effectively what will be in Z uh, and what will be in Y. But then if I kind of look at the object from the working camera head on, you can see now that I can only really move it in X and Y, not Z. So the axis are always in alignment with the camera view and just limits you to the movement of how you're looking at the object. So a couple of last things before we move on to something else. And um, we also have some group selection modes as well. So um, if I box select a bunch of axes and I do the hotkey spacebar M, it takes me into multi-axis mode, which means everything that I've got selected, I'm, gonna, I'm through the sliders, I'm going to manipulate all together. So here you see in multi-axis mode, if I select these and I do X, Y, Z or, or the rotation, I can actually uh, manipulate all those objects at once and the clue here is the multi-axis label on the tab. If I do spacebar M again that takes me out of multi-axis mode and then I'm back into whatever I've actually got selected. So that's quite nice as well. And of course these manipulators are available for any object within the scene. So you know if I've got my camera, my camera is going to have the same kind of manipulators. Uh, the difference will be on rotation depends on whether it's a target or free camera. Uh, my lights, if I just unhub my light for a second, will also have exactly the same manipulator mechanism. Uh, I can go through and rotate. So once again, it's a great improvement on the manipulators and navigation that we had before and also it's consistent with other areas of flame as we'll see a bit later on. So in this we're going to have a whistle stop tour through the changes to the rendering engine to do with PBR, physically based rendering and physically based shading within action. So we've got a couple of geometries in here. We've got one of the new Maya Hypershade objects as well, uh, just to show you how this works. Uh, we've got two lights on the scene, uh, just lighting our objects up. Uh, these will be relevant in a second. Um, we've got some other things that we're going to turn on and turn off. First off though, we're going to look at this shader. So when we turn shaders on, if they're not attached to anything inside of the scene, 
they're going to affect everything, all the objects inside of there. Obviously, if we parent a shader up to a particular geometry, then it's only going to affect that. Now, PBR and PBS shading, by and large, works best when we start working with IBLs, image-based lighting as well. So here we've got a camera, and we've got one of our default IBLs, and we're just going to unhide that for a second. Now, you can use standard lights in conjunction with this, but we find that it tends to look a little bit nicer for these purposes if we turn the, um, the two... Uh, point lights off for a second. So what this shader is doing at the moment is it's controlling the surface properties of all the objects because it's not attached to anything in the scene. You can see down here that in our shader tab it defaults to physically based. Uh, we've got all the other options underneath that we had before. Physically based is now the default. And by and large we're controlling a couple of things. We're controlling sort of like the roughness or the matteness of the surface you can see here. And we're also then playing around with how reflective that surface is as well. Now like I said we can attach multiple shaders in scene. So at the moment this is affecting everything. Um, if we want to you can parent these up but here we've also got a shader that is just linked to our ground plane. So once again we can then independently play around with the reflectivity or the properties of different surfaces so you can kind of fine tune it. So you can find the shader node in the node bin, go all nodes, look for S for shader, drag it out and you can start working with it. The other thing that we've got inside of Action is PBS maps. Now PBS maps, as we've got here, um, allow you to customize uh, what is actually going to be applied to a surface so we get all different properties. Now what we mean by that, what I mean by that, is if we come out to our uh, batch schematic, um, what I've got here is I've drawn, very crudely, um, a whole bunch of textures. So we've got like a bit of a yellow triangle thing, we've got some white lines, we've got a, like a white screen, we've got this is our white background that we're using inside the scene. So on this particular object, so don't forget if we select that and go uh, spacebar F, we can come in and look at that, we can frame it up. So what we're going to be doing on this particular object now is we're going to be using the media that's inside of our media list and we're going to be attaching that to a geometry via the PBS map. Now the PBS map allows us to do various things. So on this one, if we go down to the properties and I'm going to turn this one on. In my list of properties inside the PBS map, I can control different attributes of the physically based shader. So you see here I can affect the opacity, the ambient occlusion, metallic roughness and base color. So this one, uh, this is my white line that I drew, I've set to um, opacity and basically what it's doing now via PBS is it's controlling the opacity of that object. So if we came in here and we kind of rotated the object around you can see that actually what I'm doing is I'm cutting like a kind of like a crisp curly whirly quaver kind of shape out using that as a transparency map. This is quite nice. By using that square map and changing it to metallic, I can actually control the reflectivity in a very localized way on that surface. So I guess you're kind of getting the idea now that whatever we feed in, depending on the property that we're using on the PBS material, we can control those things. And this one, we're doing something even more simple. We can actually control either globally throughout the whole object or as, um, as you can see here by the shape we've drawn, the actual base color of an object as well. So this is kind of like a way of sticking a transfer on or a texture in a certain way, but it's actually a base color that we're using. Now what's nice about this is that we can actually also have multiple of these on any given time. So I can say that this is gonna be my base color, but also in this area, it's gonna be quite reflective. And actually I wanna cut out uh, a certain section of it by using the transparency map. So you can see that's a very flexible way. It's a very manual way that you can build up your own PBS maps uh, and using PBR shading actually on these objects. So we've got one more little trick with uh, PBRs uh, before we look at something else, and that's to do with substance PBR. So if we go into our node bin and look for substance PBRs and drag that out onto a geometry, this is gonna take me to a browser uh, where we can browse all the substance PBRs that are included with the system. So these have been created to have different properties. You can see we've got quite a mixture as default. We've got some fabrics, we've got some metals, um, some wood, some stone. When you start playing around with these, you're gonna see that there's different elements built into the shader that you can kind of work with. These were actually built through algorithmic substance design as well. So if you wanna go and, or if you've got a license that, you can actually go and use that. So here what we've done is that we've applied that PBR, that shader, to 
this part of the geometry, this geometry here. Now, when you do this, this looks a little bit like um, substance no, that we had before, and it actually is, except this is a physically based shader that's been built up, and you can see that we've got all the different elements inside here as well, and this is the central control for everything. Now, when you do this, um, it puts a shader node in, but the shader node is pretty much redundant. It won't actually do anything into our scene because it's just there to facilitate this construct working on your geometry. Uh, but what you do do, but what you do have is the properties that you would normally adjust inside the shader broken out as separate elements. So here we've got one for the metallicness of the object. You can see I can make it a bit more metallic, and the roughness. You're just going to be adjusting in in a slightly different way. You've also got things for reflections and normal maps and ambient occlusion. If you double tap on the main control, the thing that has substance PBR on it, you get some more advanced options as well. So you know the things like the texture size. But depending on how the PBR has been built, you're going to find that you've got different parameters inside of here. So one of the ones that you get on this nice metallic paint one is that we can go through and we can start deciding on you know, how much peeling of the paint, how much rust is on there. And on some of the other shaders, you're going to get different parameters depending on how it's been built. So that very quickly is our new shader technology, PBR, physically based rendering and physically based shading inside of Action. You can see there's a variety of things you can do and also don't forget that you've also got the camera effects that you can also apply on them just for an added bit of realism, the ambient occlusion and things like reflection really make this start to stand out. In case you forget, start trying to work with IBLs when you're using them, they give you the best results and the most photorealistic look. So another fundamental change to action to do with the rendering is the way that we deal with our outputs. So the output menu has changed slightly. So we've now got render layers and render passes. That's more in alignment with what you'd expect out of a 3D product like Maya. But also the way that we reuse some of these render passes internally as well. So here's our we've got spaceship fighters now. This is very exciting. We've moved on from um, atmospheric fighters to spaceborne fighters. Um, when we do our comp, obviously the default output, the render layer and render pass for this, as we now call it, is the primary composition, which is our final result. Now down the list here, we've got all these parameters that are sort of kind of constantly there. And uh, if we're using shaders inside the scene, and in this particular case, you can see that we've got some nice motion blur on these, um, it will actually be using the motion blur render pass, if you like, looped back internally into action and reused by that shader. And once again, if we were using some things like um, uh, Z depth, then it will be looking and using the respective Z depth pass to drive that shader inside of action. So if effectively, these are already being generated. And as we use shaders within the scene, the shader will automatically pick up on what pass it needs to use. But if we want to start outputting some render layers and render passes or objects and respective passes separately, uh, this also allows us to streamline that process a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to create, oh actually before we do that, we're going to look at our outputs a moment. So this is our action output inside of Batch. You can see it's just the, the primary comp layer. And if we add a new output, and we're just going to rename that and we just call it, uh, let's just call it Green One. That's the fighter name. We've now got a green one output, and by default, uh, nothing's really selected for that at all. All of our schematic is grayed out. So if we go into the edit output menu, and uh, we're going to select all of our cameras and our lights, because we kind of want those on, that would be kind of good to have. And then I know that the fighter that we want is going to be uh, this one down here. So we're going to select all those and the textures, and they are now all going to be part of this render layer. And once again, by default, it's just going to output basically the beauty of this. Uh, but if we want to use some of this downstream inside a batch, then maybe it'd be good to have the mat. So we're going to activate the mat. Now, when we start selecting these, we can either just view what the pass is, or if we tap on the little button, we look at our outputs here, it will start actually adding these to the outputs for that particular render layer. So on some 3D motion, um, I'd like to have some Z depth for where it is. So we're going to add that as well, and maybe something like uh, the ambient occlusion as well. So we can uh, go and find ambient occlusion, and we can turn that on. And now what we're going to have within this is going to be those passes. So in the viewport, to sort of toggle through these, obviously F4 is going to take you back to your default, but 
the one and two buttons will toggle you through all of your available outputs that you've got enabled for this particular render layer. So it's a it's a little thing, but it's a, a nice streamlining. And like I said, it, this uh, render passes can be either selected to be used outside in batch, um, or they will be used internally by the shaders that we apply as part of the new render engine inside of Action. Two quick ones here to do with 3D models, import and export. So we've got uh, an empty action scene here, a couple of lights, and we now got a contextual menu for importing and exporting FBX models and 3D models that we bring in, geometry. So if we import, uh, we're going to go down to um, our FBXs, we're going to bring in one of these hypershade ones again. Um, some changes to the import menus, uh, we can convert this to an actual action objects, which is kind of like the standard behavior. So here we've got our object group in, can't undo that. Um, if we import that again, that same object, but we change it to a read file, we now have a live link to the read file. This then brings in those geometries as, a, as an FBX scene. Now, this allows me to do a couple of things in one go here. So this is an FBX scene. Obviously, this is my model coming in. Uh, but you're going to notice that the menu has changed somewhat down here. We can now cache this. So we can actually make it part of the scene as instead of it being a read file. But in this mode, it is a default read file. And we also do have some more parameters where we can modify um, global adjustments on it. So things like you know, doing um, sorting, false two-side shading and stuff. Now, it brings it in as a group. Uh, and there's been some major changes in groups as well. So this is coming in as FBX scene, but we're going to do the same thing with the traditional way of importing. But essentially now, um, groups inside of Action, whether they come in like this or you make themselves, are sub-schematic. So we can actually go into the group, we can modify, we can add some stuff, and you can see that we've actually still got the rest of the Action scene greyed out. So tilde takes us back to the Action level. F8, F8 will take us into that group. Now there's some interesting additions to workflow on this as well. So the idea is that we could have multiple objects grouped within here because this makes it convenient to work with. Um, but before in the old behavior, it was always a bit of a pain to try and you know attach things in. So we've got an intelligent parenting mechanism now. So if we brought out things like an axis, and maybe we bring out a material, and maybe we bring out a shader, and we can actually hook these into the hierarchy of the group external to it without going inside. So if we parent the axis in, you can see that we've got this dotted line. Um, if we do our shader, so I'm going to hook that in, we've got a dotted line there. And once again, if we do like our material as well, all dotted lines. Now what this actually means, if we go into the group again, is that it intelligently works out uh, what it needs to parent things up on you. So you can see here that the material node's been parented up. Uh, we've got a global axis that is parented up. These are external to the group, uh, but they are all selectable and modifiable either inside the group or outside the group. So it's just a nice way of being able to work with objects quite quickly and simply with groups. And like I said, you can actually create these groups yourself as well. So just resetting the scene quickly, I'm going to bring in two objects. I'm going to bring in an FBX plane. And we're just going to rotate that around, make it kind of like a little bit bigger. So I've got lights in here. And I'm also going to bring in uh, that same hypershade object as well. So now we've got a couple of things going on. Let's move that down a little bit. Now, as you may have seen before, uh, we have in our contextual also the ability to export FBX models. So before we could export things like location points and cameras. Uh, now we can export a variety of objects inside um, with some textures and some animation. If we go export, and I'm just going to go to a location here, uh, we can save all supported objects or we can just do the selected objects that we've got inside the scene. Uh, I'm going to give that a name. We're going to call it uh, Stewie Model. I'm just going to save that. Come back out into our batch. Bring out a new action. I'm going to pop inside of here for a second and we're going to go and import uh, that same model. And once again, you've got all those those same options where you bring in. Notice down here that we've got the option to bring in models, lights, cameras, mesh animations, normals, uh, create media. So this has been once again slightly changed and modifiable up to date. Uh, loading that in brings in all those elements that we had. It's going to tidy up the schematic quickly. And once again, if we come down to our new camera from the scene, and we go into our no preferences, 
and we uh, activate uh, some shading things like that and turn off the scene ambient you can see that what we've actually done is re-imported uh, that exported model that we had in the previous action uh, with all the objects so it's really nice so we've got groups the improvements to groups way we bring in 3d models and also now the ability to export uh, 3d geometry and lights and some textures and some animation back out to an fbx scene